So look, bro, another reaction video. Um, got one of these interviews. I ain't did them in a minute, in a long, long minute. You know what I'm saying? Finna hop straight into it though. Y'all be cool. Enjoy the video. Get what you need to enjoy the video. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, to the females out there, I ain't got no like. On no Instagram DMs in a minute, you know, they're a little as, as a matter of fact. That's what I meant to say, and I'm just playing. I'm just playing. It's early morning. I feel good, bro. I feel good. Let's get into this video, though. Hey, shout out to Underbelly. He don't get enough credit. He need his flowers. The golden ones. Bro got the dopest interviews on the internet. Forget your favorite podcaster, bro. I don't care about the rap niggas no more. All right, Charlie. Charlie Jones. Charlie, uh, you were the warden at uh, Holman Prison. In Atmore, Alabama. Right. Atmore. How many years were you the warden at Holman? What the hell? Oh, well, I was warden for 18. I worked in the prison system for 35. So you graduated. 35 years. And you grew up where? In, in Alabama? Right here. He looked dead. Tell me about your childhood. You had both your parents? Yeah. And Phil wouldn't How would you describe your childhood? Oh, just normal. I uh, went to school, finished school, went to college, finished that. Uh, come back here. That's what I'm saying, bro. That's the thing about college. I ain't finna get all the way into it, but it's a lot of people that go to college for what they wanna be, and when they get out of college, they don't be that. I don't think college degrees matter that much no more, and please don't, I hope that y'all don't take that wrong. Um, you went to college. It's not like you went to college, got out, and was the warden. I don't think they teach warden classes or prison classes in college, therefore, he said he was doing that for 35 years, been awarded for 18 years. So you got out of college and went to a fucking prison. I mean, damn, I cussed again. Gotta bleep that. Went to prison to become a CO. <laughs> high school graduated that, college graduated that, and went to be a CEO for somebody that all you need is a high school diploma. We can work there. They got 19 year olds, 20 year olds that CEOs, bro. Wait, that was a waste of time. And then you graduated to be a, a, a warden, so you went to college for no reason. Or just to say you went there. Or just for the education. Which really don't mean nothing. <laughs> college education, no. After high school, you can get through life. But Graduate now, high school. Graduate high and, school. Uh, I'm nine miles from the prison. I, I lived here most of the time. I've been moved around all over the state at different prisons. How many prisoners did you have at Holman? Approximately a thousand. That's a lot. And you had death row inmates at Holman? Right. Hol Holman's the only prison in Alabama that has the, right. the, the death penalty, has executions, right. right? As warden for 18 years, wh wh what's your view on the death penalty? Do you, do you see it as an effective way to- Yeah, I do. And I'm the president. Control crime or-, or I keep, think I put keep, it there. Keep society in, in line? Well, I think you have to on on uh, bad cases. Uh. I think it should come back. I'm keeping it real. They need, and I, what I mean by come back, it's a lot of states that disown it. They got it up out of there. Say it's not humanitarian. But bro, if you kill somebody over jealousy, yeah, you get the you you get the needle. You give them three ways, bro. Needle, lynch, or the uh or the gas. <laughs> Pick your poison. I'm keeping it real, bro. What else? Um, molesting? Yeah, pick your poison. We executing everybody, bro. And it's already overpopulated out here. It is, for real. It's overpopulated. So I think that'll calm the, look, it'll calm the crime down. And let us be able to pull up to a light. When it turn red and we not 25 cars back. Don't y'all have y'all live in LA or, or populated cities? So you, like, dang, well, I'm always 25 cars back. The light turned red, then green, and I still ain't pass it. It's red again. Now I'm 13 cars back. Green, red again. Now I'm six cars back. Like, how I'm at this damn light and it went green five times already. Still here, bro. I hate y'all. I hate traffic. And if you're over 70, I don't think you should be driving. Why? Because I'm the president and I say so. Uh, I mean, you so. can't, you know, for certain things, you can do other things, but... The way death row was set up, uh, it's pretty bad. You have to have pretty bad crime to be put on death row. You have to have a, 
uh, combination of murder, robbery, murder, rape, or something like that. Ain't no combination. Man, for. Do one. But uh, sooner or later, the, these other non-serious crimes, in my view, will have to be done other ways because the the uh, taxpayer is not going to pay to have all of them locked up. It's too many of them. It gets expensive, right? Yeah. How? So as warden at home. And I, I think it should be the same fee. I mean, how do it cost more? Right now, today, if you steal a car, right? Let me just give you all an example. Today, if you steal a car, you're going to jail, right? And when it's time to die, we just take you out your cell and execute you. How is that spending more money? You, you doing everybody just grab niggas out the sales. You just start grabbing people, that's it. You ain't got a special house them. They already finna die, so why you want a special house them and isolate them? Cause death row inmates be up in the hole for years, bro, before they get executed. Just let them live out they, you know what I'm saying? And, and if they got that whole mantra like, I'm finna die anyway, so I'm finna do anything up in here. Oh well, the mother prisoner shouldn't be in there anyway. If you can't do the time, don't do the crime. I'm keeping the 100. So y'all are housed with death row inmates. Oh well. Oh well. Uh, part of your sale. job was to perform the executions, right? Right. He looked like one of the fools that pulled You're using the, the electric chair or, or lethal injection. It was a chair. So by the time a man gets. So he put the wet sponge on their head? This is how I know electric uses happen, bro. No matter if you got dreads, wave, a mullet, whatever. When it's your day, and this is, this is kind of messed up, it kind of messed with your head. You be in prison this whole time, but on the day they about to get you up out of here, they let you eat whatever you want. I'm talking about whatever in the world, right, with your scallions. I don't know how you gonna be hungry and I'm about to die. This ain't even gonna digest yet. I ain't gonna. <laughs> I'd rather die hungry. I don't know why, but I'd rather die. Anyway, no matter what kind of hairstyle you got, they shaving that middle part off, getting a wet sponge, putting it on your head, then putting the electricity thing on your head just so the electricity can run through your body faster through the wet sponge. Y'all know electricity and water don't mix. Scandalous. And then you're done. And then they have witnesses. Lawyers, probably the uh, people of the family who you did the crime to, your family. You know what I'm saying? You <laughs> That's how I to know the electric that chair. Happened. Where do you see your role in his the end of his life? Do you do you see it as as, as you're responsible for that? You're the one that's pulling the trigger. Well, technically, I guess I was, but a lot of things happen between the time that he's arrested and the time he has to sit in that chair. Uh, it's a long, drawn-out process that can last as long as 20 years, yeah. sometimes longer than that. Yeah. There's a lot of steps a suspect would have to go through before he uh, sits in the electric chair, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, a crime committed, and there, there's an investigation, and then they follow the investigation until they arrest somebody and then he's arraigned and then he's tried and 12 people to me I, I, am i tripping so to me he's sitting down in an interview to y'all is he running i think he's sound out of breath he sound like he running and doing an interview i'm not lying because to me he's sitting down but i'll be i, I got better weed than y'all just <laughs> keeping it real so I, I might be tripping right now is he sitting down or is he running Yeah, bro. Set in judgment on him, and if he's convicted, he goes to prison, goes to death row. Uh, then his appeal process starts, and it is long and drawn out. Uh, Alabama Supreme Court, Court of Criminal Appeals, uh, State Court, it can last on and on. So by the time he gets to the electric chair, it's it's pretty certain that this is that he's guilty by the time yeah well not always there, there's some time uh, they can go right up pretty close to the time i was just and just about to say that i was just about to say that so if somebody get on death row you know what i'm saying they get trial guilty or whatever now they on death row they about to get the chair 
when he was talking about, oh, somebody do the crime, whatever, they do the investigation, and then they decide how much time they're going to give them, then you're going to get on death row. Now, after you get arrested and you go to prison, it could still take you like 15 to 20 years to actually get executed, bro. It could take you that long. Another thing, it's a lot of people, especially over the last 20 years, it's a lot of people, bro, in the high percentile, I can't give it to you, but in the high percentile, that was on death row, and they about to get up out of here within the next three years. They've been on death row 15 years. They got three years left to, like, to live. And the state come back, attorney coming back, overturn it, and just give them life in prison without the possibility of parole, meaning he's never coming home. They just let him live and, like, you got life, bro, we ain't going to kill you. You can just go ahead and, you know what I'm saying? It's a lot of those been getting overturned. It's a lot. They give them that. They give them that sentence up in court. And for some reason, the higher courts, like the Supreme Court, whoever the fuck that do it, I don't know. Them the ones that be overturning it for them. Like, this ain't that serious to take this man's life. But to me, if you rape a child, bro, the R word, a child or a female, I don't care if it's your first time, you never did a crime in your life, you get in the chair. Not lying. Get in the chair. Attorney come up with something that he appeals one last time to the... Alabama Supreme Court, and uh, they'll give him a stay. It don't always last. Might last a day, might last a week, might last three or four years. Uh, but most of the time, uh, once I'm served or was served with a warrant, a death warrant, death warrant. then it's Ooh. getting really serious. Uh, I get that warrant 30 days prior to the date, and uh, during that time, the attorney <coughs> for both sides, they, they get busy, and uh, they try to come up with something to stop it. Sometimes they do, and by that time, most times they didn't. What is that uh, death row inmate's last moments like before, before he... He's executed. Let us know. Let us know. Let us know. Can you describe that? Well, you you talking about the day of? The day of, yeah. Well, the day of, he, the inmate would spend most of the day with his family on the visiting yard. We'd leave him out there approximately two hours before the. What is that like? Oh my God! What is that like, bro? Knowing you finna be gone. Let's look at both ends. Me visiting a family member. Me being a person on death row, seeing my family, like, I'm going to be gone in two hours. I love y'all, man. Y'all ain't doing nothing but crying the whole time. Me making jokes, like, I'm going to haunt you. I'm letting you know that. Don't be doing nothing. I'm going to be watching. Like, you know you. And we all know what the other side is like. I don't care what nobody say. Like, that's. Whew. Shouldn't have did the crime, though. <laughs> hey, look, you shouldn't have did it. You shouldn't have did it, bro. You had to do something horrific to get on death row. Oh, well, after everything I said, your family probably thinking that too. Well, you shouldn't have did that to all 86 of them kids. Then you should have, you know what I'm saying? Oh, well. Time to oh, well. get him ready. And I might not even go and, if you really uh, did we it. take him off the vision yard, escort him back to his cell. The execution team would get him dressed, shave his head. Told you. Shave his ankle, left ankle. <laughs> and uh, get him ready. By that time, it's right around 12, uh, 12 a.m., 12.01 a.m., and they uh, they would call me. I'd be in my office. I stayed they in my office. They're going to hit him at like 2 or 3 in the morning. Midnight. Do what? Midnight. And some prisons back in the day, which is cold, bro, they have a light at the end of the prison, on top of the prison. Somewhere in the prison, bro, or the guard tower or whatever. Every time they executing somebody, that light would come on, so the whole prison would know. Not even lying. Yeah. yeah. I'd stay in my office while they did that in case we got a call from the governor or from the attorney general or from the court putting it off. If we didn't, then somebody would man the phone while I would go to the death chamber. By the time I got down there, they've got him in the chair strapped in, ready to go. By law, 
I had to read that death warrant to him. And so he can I remember would ask it. him if he had any last request or yeah, can y'all stop? Or statement. Why y'all doing this? Most of them didn't. What you gonna uh, say? If not, then I would tell the two officers in the death chamber to make him ready. Final, final readiness was putting the helmet on him and putting the ankle bracelet on him. Striving him down so he and, can't and move. And I would leave the death chamber, go in the next door through his body? to the equipment room. The two officers would come out. We didn't want to leave anybody in there with him for fear that somebody might pass out and fall into him. And uh, once they come out, they'd give me a set. So this was a real thing when it comes to execution. They start doing the lethal, like the injections with the needle, because with the electricity, bro, and this was a real thing, with the electricity, they'd go ahead and give somebody what they're supposed to give them, the mandatory, like, the votes through their body. And when they do it, some of them fools will live afterwards, bro. So it was a real argument to the courts, to like, in the country, that if they live through the first one, then you got to let them live. You have to. I don't know if that really went through or not, but it's a few, few, a few, few. It's a few fools that live through it. Not a few, it's a lot of them. And that became a real issue to the point they got weight with the electricity and started using the lethal injections. That's why those needles came into play. Signal, tap on the door, and uh, it was all over with. It's just a flip of a switch? Press of a button. Press of a button. How did this affect you personally, doing this? Well, it I mean, got did you to. Perform? It got to. I did 17 men and one woman. How did it affect you personally? Well. <laughs> you got to. That's a good question. I, I've never let their problem become my problem. And I didn't yeah, put them there. Me. I didn't go out and arrest them and sit in judgment on them. Once they got there. I don't care if you didn't put them there. It just something that's humane. I don't care if it's your job, bro. I don't care if this is the right thing to do. I don't care if they were supposed to go. I don't care if they was the worst human in the world. It got to be something humane of you pressing a button, knowing that you press the button and watch them people die. What are you talking about? I don't know, how do you not feel that and go to sleep at it? You got police officers that see shootings. They don't even do it. They see kids starve almost to death. They see the, and they go home. Some of them quit the force. They be needing to go talk to people. They need a psychiatrist, I promise you. And you mean to tell me you pushing buttons, watching these people in their eye die, and you don't feel nothing, bro? Damn. That was their problem. And, uh... They knew that. <laughs> and I tried to I treat them in such yeah. a way. Yeah, cold And had my staff treat them in such a way yeah, cold that when the time came, individual. you know, we didn't have to look away from them. We could look them in the eye and, what and let the them know what's fixing to take place and what to watch for. And, you know, here it comes. And uh, afterwards... You know, How can you prepare somebody for death is what he's saying. He's preparing them for it. You can't prepare. I don't care what the, I don't care how many Bibles. You can't prepare nobody for that shit. Everybody in this world, and you could probably ask 99% of the people, hey, do you want to know when you're going to die? They're going to say no. Imagine knowing when you are, the day, the time. You can't prepare nobody for that shit. But I'm dying. I'm, a, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. It, it it lays on your mind, did me, but not a guilt thing. Just hoping that I had done everything to be sure that his case was as perfect as it could be. That there was in no way me or my staff the cause of him having to sit in that chair when maybe he shouldn't have. If he shouldn't have, then it was somebody else's uh, mishandling, not us. So, 
you know, I that's I facts. That's facts. That's facts. But still, you know what? Lose sleep over it. Uh, I would to tell you the lie. truth. I have a heart. You know what I'm they saying? Seldom think about it. Damn. He a what cold kind of individual. reactions would you see from the men as they approach their their last day? Not, on not a lot. Uh, crying. Most of them was right ready. Man. They would, you know, we would take them out of their regular cell 24 hours ahead of time and put them in what we call the ready cell, the death cell. Once we got them down there and they were away from all their friends on the cell block, they settled down really well. <laughs> uh, I can Bro, only why you do this interview? one that seemed like he he carried a grudge to the chair, but the rest of them didn't. They they let it go, and uh, most of them at one time or another during that short period admitted what they done. Eventually, they admitted their crimes. Yeah, yeah. Not all of them, but most of them. Is there one in particular that stood out in your memory? Yeah, but I can't recall his name. Uh, yeah, I want to hear if he was black or Hey, uh, you've seen people that carried, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, but they were mad all the time. You had to be careful how you spoke to them. Bro, you racist. say good morning to him, man. Get mad. Getting the vibes. I ain't gonna lie. That's kind of the way uh, this guy was. Where we at? Eleven minutes in. I'm getting the vibes, bro. Is the hard word. What do you think the core cause is of a, of a hardened criminal's behavior? I mean, do you, do you think it was his environment or his family or his, bra his brain chemistry? What, what do you think is the cause? Yeah, of, that, of that, it's, the it's the person. It's the person. I don't know if I knew that. I could probably rest easy the rest of my life. I, I don't know. Uh, I think it's a combination of things. I, I think a lot of them grew up without a your arms, father, your stomach. not knowing who their it's father was. Crazy, bro. And uh, getting with the wrong crowd as they grew up, taking, making bad choices. It's the person, bro. You can't. Somebody in the hood, bro, they grow up as killers. Somebody in the hood, they grow up as lawyers. Somebody in the rich neighborhood grow up as killers. Some of them grow up as lawyers, bro. You got people that fantasize serial killers and they want to do that. You got people that see stuff on TV, they want to do that. It's the person. At the end of the day, it's the person, bro. You know, that's all brain. Because some people just go left. You can't blame nobody but themselves if every day they wake up, all they want to do is bad things, bro. You can't blame the environment. You can't blame their parents. See, you, you can't blame them. You, you can't blame nobody but them. That's what I'm trying to say. And uh, going around trying to take away stuff that didn't belong to them. It all goes hand in hand, doesn't it? Do what? It, it all goes hand in hand. It's, you know, to answer your question, I think it's, it's, just, it's a combination of all that stuff. And you're retired now, but but in your decades of working in the prison system, what what how have you seen criminals change? I mean, do you, do you see they're more violent? They're, how, how are they different now than than they were in the past? Uh, Drugs are a bigger part of the picture now, right? The what? Drugs are a bigger part of the picture. Drugs. Now. Oh, yeah. She said drugs. Uh, most of not on death row, but regular population. Most of the inmates in the regular population that. It maybe didn't come to prison because of drugs, but drugs was always involved. Mm -hmm. How do you look at this part of your life that you that you had? I mean, th th this this chapter of your life. It's certainly very unusual. H how do you view it? Well, I, I guess I look at it like anybody else looks at something that they do. A, a farmer or. A, or uh, listen to how whatever. they describe. There's something that I did. And mind y'all, I'm not knocking him for being a warden. I'm not knocking him for being a CEO. It's just how cold his heart is, bro. 
it's how cold his heart is. I be watching war stories. Y'all should look that up on YouTube. I watch that a lot, a lot, a lot. I'm gonna start reacting to him. And um, you got people, snipers, that's been camping out, literally. They will camp out a, um, a house, bro. They will camp out a compound. They will camp out a village for 11 days straight in one spot. Piss right there, eating little snacks right there. The point I'm trying to make is once they see their mark that they've been trying to hit for 11 days, and they actually do take them out, they feel bad, real bad. Understand this, they don't know that mark. They know, they don't have a personal vendetta against them. They didn't hit their car. They didn't have sex with their girl, none of that. The government sent them over there. Even though he don't personally know them, the government sent them, he pulled the trigger. So he feel bad, you know what I'm saying? How you don't have a heart, like, I, I, I promise you, that would be on my mind. That, that, I couldn't do this job. I couldn't take people's life like that. Even though, of course, if you don't push the button, somebody else will. Well, let him deal with what I would have to deal with if I push the button. Because the nightmares would be crazy. That'd be crazy. And I knew what it was when I took the job. It wasn't no surprise, you know. I knew that eventually, the, that I'd have to do that. And now, you know, I look back on it, and uh, I know I did everything I could to see that they were treated, not just at death row, but all of them, that were treated right, wasn't abused, and... Hold on, one more story, one more story, one more story about the war stories thing. So, this is another sniper story, too. Um, he went over there when he was 24 years old, bro. Um, he was up in uh, Somalia, 24 years old. Now, he a pastor. He regret everything, bro, going over there. And the reason I say that, because this man has 31 confirmed kills. 31. And that haunts him. Over and over, he didn't know none of them fools. He was sent to pull. He was the head man for the. How do you not feel something after thirty-one confirmed kills? How, you know what I'm saying? And it's not like he wanted to do it. He had to do it. You can't let them slide. Like, nah, bro. I smoked five niggas last week. I'm not finna. Do it. Like, I'm doing too much. I smoked nine niggas two weeks ago. I smoked eighteen niggas three weeks ago. I ain't finna. Pop, pop, just keep on, pop, not, pop, just keep tapping it, tap. Just keep tapping that trigger, man. And, uh, at the same time, you now we didn't, we didn't let them do us that way either. But we didn't have that much trouble. And I look back on that as that I uh, did all I could to be sure they, they were treated right. I met them on the street cool. and uh, they would run to me with a hand out and uh, you know some of them I recognized some of them I didn't and they'd have to tell me who they were uh, I've had some of them tell me you know I, I kept them from getting in bad he only said that because he out of jail he only said that because he out and uh he only saying that because he seen y'all, y'all out, y'all ran into each other. I knew all. by it, something I could gauge what I did. Maybe, maybe I did all I I could to do what was right. I don't, I don't have any regrets or anything. And the main thing I mentioned it a while ago, I did not let people put me on a guilt trip about what I had to do. And I did not allow the inmate problem to become my problem. Under Belly with another dope interview. I'm gonna catch y'all a little later. I'm about to go work out. 100.